This program is brought to you by Emory University. It is my pleasure to introduce one of our own, Dr. Larry Sperling, who is a CATS professor in preventive cardiology and also a professor of global health uh, at the Rollins School of Public Health. Um, he was the founder and director of our uh, Center for Prevention uh, up until last year when he now transitioned to a new role as the executive director of the Million Hearts Program at the CDC. Um, Dr. Sperling needs no introduction in terms of his ability to educate. He's an outstanding teacher and has received many awards for his teaching and very active in the medical school. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say and get his perspective about the post-COVID future of cardiovascular prevention. Thank you very much, Pooja. And, and it really is an honor to give our last grand rounds this year. Um, I'm going to talk about the post-COVID future of cardiovascular prevention. And with this being our last grand rounds, it gives all of you a, a chance to think about uh, some of the messages uh, and main points I'm going to emphasize today. So, so I have nothing to disclose. I have no conflicts related to my presentation. Just importantly, that my comments today are my comments and, and do not represent the organizations that I work for, serve, and represent. And, and as an aside, uh, that's our family there. It's been a really busy week. I mentioned to Pooja and Chris uh, in the past week, our youngest son, Daniel, graduated from Emory as part of a virtual graduation ceremony and we just finished a 1,438 mile uh, drive back uh, from Atlanta to Chicago and back in 48 hours to uh, unload the apartment of our oldest son who's a graduate student at the University of Chicago. So I'm gonna talk about the post-COVID future of cardiovascular prevention, and I've organized my presentation as follows. Uh, first, a little bit of information about the past. Uh, then I'll really highlight uh, what is the present and, and give you a reality check. And then I want to spend the majority of the time that I have with our Grand Rounds presentation today uh, really emphasizing and highlighting uh, the future. Uh, and now in all walks of life, not just in medicine, uh, what we will refer to as the post-COVID future. So a little bit about the past. This uh, photo here depicts an individual who many credit with being the father of cardiovascular prevention. And you can see uh, Dwight Eisenhower there uh, playing with a stethoscope. And uh, this was supposed to be an interactive presentation, but, but you can ask yourself if you know who this father of cardiovascular prevention was. And this is Paul Dudley White, who was a strong advocate for the prevention of heart disease. He also uh, was a major impetus behind starting the Framingham Heart Study, oversee the creation of the NHLBI and AHA. He was Eisenhower's physician following his uh, 1955 myocardial infarction. And uh, Paul Dudley White was well known for saying, exercise more, eat healthy, learn your family's medical history. Well, uh, a little history, Emory history lesson here. Uh, Paul Dudley White's last fellow at the MGH was Willis Hurst, and uh, Dr. Hurst was chair at Emory for 35 years. Uh, and uh, he uh, started one of the, still to this day, one of the two best uh, well-known heart textbooks, and it's now in its 14th edition, The, the Heart. Uh, Dr. Hurst became also uh, AHA president and Lyndon Johnson's physician when uh, Lyndon Johnson had a myocardial infarction in 1972. And, and I will say that both Dr. Hurst and Wayne Alexander were strong supporters and, and helped encourage the start of our preventive cardiology program at Emory. And Dr. Hurst passed away in 2011 at age 90. In 1961, with just two words, Bill Cannell helped to change our understanding of the underlying causes of heart disease and stroke. And with these two words, the field of preventive cardiology was born. And these two words were risk factors. Uh, this is the first paper published from Framingham in 1961. And, and we know these risk factors well today. In fact, we ask our patients at, at each visit and when they're hospitalized, and a, a lot of preventive cardiology is focused on cardiovascular risk factor 
modification and risk reduction. From this original paper, you can see that risk factors have more than an additive effect. In fact, they have an exponential effect. And we know that many risk factors cluster. Uh, and here, just to point out that in the first Framingham cohort, one of the most potent predictors of risk was LVH. Well, when the NIH was dedicated, uh, and this is now 80 years ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, we cannot be a strong nation unless we are a healthy nation. Uh, and I'll remind you that it is the National Institutes of Health. It's not called the National Institutes of Disease. Uh, a frightening statistic published in 2018 is that only 29% of young adults in our country today are fit to serve in the U.S. military. And as we talk about a post-COVID focus on cardiovascular prevention, uh, we need to realize that part of what is playing out right now is a very vulnerable, unwell population in the United States being assaulted by a viral illness. The last slide I'll show here in terms of the past is my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather uh, developed coronary disease in his mid to late 40s. And, and it's really one of the strong reasons that I dedicated my professional career, career to cardiovascular prevention because I, I learned firsthand about the impact of early heart disease on an individual in the prime of his life and also the impact on a family. Well, we are in the midst of a pandemic uh, and two former World Heart Federation presidents uh, left me with quotes that uh, have, have really stuck with me in terms of thinking about uh, my career and my service moving forward. Uh, Salim Youssef said in 2013 that cardiovascular disease is the biggest epidemic or pandemic ever known to mankind, and we need strategies to address epidemics. And Valentin Fuster said that secondary prevention is urgent. Well, take a look at this slide here. We are in the midst of a pandemic, and, and look on the, on the left, you can see uh, folks wearing masks, uh, somebody with a sign that says wear a mask, and, and look at this public notice uh, shutting down churches and theaters and picture halls and pool rooms on public gatherings consisting of, of 10 or more are prohibited. And, and how scary it is that 102 years later, uh, except for these photos now not being in black and white, uh, we see these same photos uh, and we have the same reality here in our country and in our world today. So I really wanna talk about the post-COVID future of cardiovascular prevention. And, and let's think about cardiovascular diseases and cardiometabolic diseases as an epidemic and a pandemic. Because our approaches, if they are truly an epidemic and pandemic, which they are, are to identify vectors, complex causes, barriers, roadblocks, factors that propagate these pandemics. And then our goal should be control, elimination, and, and ultimately eradication. So that was a little bit about the past. Uh, now I'll move into the present and give you a reality check. Uh, so this is a slide from March 22nd, not e even two months ago. And, and on a Doc Matter community, a trainee posed the question about the future of preventive cardiology, uh, given that the 1918 pandemic was followed by the Great Depression. And, and she raised the question about what, what is the future of special things like preventive cardiology that have been deemed non-essential. Bob just reviewed the numbers to date, and you can see it, the, the numbers as of March 22nd, uh, and, and where we are in not even two months, we're approaching 5 million cases worldwide, uh, 90,000 deaths in our country, and, and 1,600 deaths in Georgia. Well, I responded uh, on this site here, uh, and, and really, pointed out that what is clear right now is that the burden of NCDs has led to a human civilization in great danger. And what is clear from the data is that the risk for severe COVID-related manifestations and death are being driven by the interaction of a viral illness with an unwell population 
and that we will need to invest even more in the essential services like cardiovascular prevention, preventive cardiology, and population health initiatives, uh, in addition to robust public health. And, and because of this response and um, others taking note, uh, I recently uh, wrote an invited commentary in circulation on my mind that's been published electronically and will be published in the coming weeks. Well, and I don't have to tell our audience here at Emory that in 2020 in cardiology, we can do a lot of amazing stuff. State-of-the-art uh, revascularization, imaging, destination LVADs, all kinds of EP procedures and percutaneous valves. But the reality check is even before the COVID pandemic that healthcare and the focus on health is changing. And I'm going to make the case that this change is going to be accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic and will continue to change. In our country, we spend way more than any other industrialized nation on health care, not health. 18 to 19% of our GDP, and this is absolutely not sustainable. Um, we also spend less than any other nation on health, any other industrialized nation on health. Not surprisingly, the biggest ticket item for healthcare, or one of the biggest ticket items, is cardiovascular diseases, over $450 billion a year. And to organizations like Emory Healthcare or Emory University, the unwell are costly. Smokers, those who are physically inactive, overweight, at stress or experiencing stress, and those with risk factors like hypertension are very costly to organizations. Well, in the U.S., we actually spend more than any industrialized nation on health care, not health, but we're dead last in quality, access, efficiency, equity, and healthy lives. So uh, we get very mediocre outcomes for what we spend, and this is from the 2019 Bloomberg Healthiest Country Index, 169 World Health Organization countries. U.S. is ranked number 35, Cuba's five spots above us, China 52, and the sub-Saharan economies are 27 out of the 30th unhealthiest. Well, in the United States, we celebrated uh, because for two decades from 1980 to 2000, and this is a, a well-known paper by Ford in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007, we significantly reduced cardiovascular death rates in our country. And I did the math for you on this paper because even from 1980 to 2000, 84% of the reduction in cardiovascular deaths were due to cardiovascular prevention as opposed to procedures and technology. Well, we should be very concerned because as of 2010 and beyond, there's been significant directional change. We've talked about flattening the curve with COVID. Well, the downward direction for cardiovascular mortality in our country unfortunately has been flattened as of 2010 and 2011 and now is on its way back up. So we should be concerned. This is a paper published a number of months ago by uh, several of my colleagues in the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and there is an alarming mortality rate change among young adults, those aged 35 to 64. The top panel is heart disease mortality, the bottom is stroke mortality, and red is concerning. Uh, in two thirds of the counties of the United States, there is an increase in cardiovascular mortality among young adults. When we look at cardiovascular diseases, uh, there's been what I call a complacency, meaning that we've become used to our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, and those in our community dying of heart attacks and strokes. On the left-hand panel, uh, this is from our world data, uh, and Bill Gates tweeted this in June of this past year. On the left-hand panel, uh, you can see that a third of deaths are from heart disease, but on uh, the next three panels, uh, you can see in blue that we actually, in terms of our media, Google Trends, New York Times database, and Guardian database, uh, although 30% or more deaths are related to heart disease, only 2 to 3% of media coverage is related to cardiovascular disease and death. 
This is a slide from Venkat Narayan, who's a colleague in the School of Public Health. And, and this data is now 17 years old, but it, it holds true today. Looking at our children in the United States, uh, we know that 20, there's a 25 to 50% risk of developing diabetes in their adult lives. And we know that type two diabetes today is more common than type one diabetes in children. Uh, and there are differences related to gender and ethnicity. This was a paper that really uh, caught my attention in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of months ago, uh, projecting out the prevalence of adult obesity and severe obesity in the United States. By 2030 on the left-hand panel, uh, it is predicted that 50% of Americans will be by definition obese, a BMI greater than 30, and then on the right-hand panel, one out of every four Americans will be severely obese. And, and the take-home message of this paper was, given the difficulty achieving meaningful weight loss, these findings highlight the importance of prevention. Today, we can geomap. Uh, we can look at risk at a population level all the way down uh, to zip codes. And, and this is a geomap of hotspots of diabetes risk in the United States. And, and it, it really points out that health varies at a very local level. Uh, I have shown this slide all over the world, and this is the city that we live in, Atlanta, Georgia. And, and we need to recognize that healthcare only determines about 20% of health and impacts only about 20% of diseases. And so the social determinants of health are very powerful. And our zip code is a greater predictor of health and disease than our genetic code. If we look at Buckhead, north of the city, average life expectancy of 84. And then Bankhead, which is a 15-minute drive to the southwest, seven miles away from Buckhead, there is a 13-year or more difference in life expectancy. We published this paper in circulation a couple of years ago now looking at social determinants of health. And we need to think very differently about our approach to traditional cardiovascular risk factors, which is what we do in healthcare, as opposed to how we think about social determinants of health, access to healthy foods, psychosocial, behavioral, and environmental factors. We need to address these very differently. Through our team at the Emory Clinical Cardiovascular Research Institute, uh, we have looked at food insecure regions and the impact of social determinants of health on vascular disease, early markers of vascular disease. Uh, and about one out of every 10 Americans live in food insecure areas. These green regions on the map of Atlanta are not parks. These green regions represent food deserts. And uh, these food deserts predict early markers of vascular dysfunction uh, measured both biologically and through biomarkers. And this was a, a paper published by Haval Kelly uh, in Circulation Cardiovascular Quality Outcomes in 2017. I also work uh, in the space of global health. And, and what has happened over the last 30 years is that ischemic heart disease has snuck up on us as the major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Uh, and, and this really uh, should uh, be humbling to us because we now live in a very global economy. And we also live in a world today where an illness in China can spread across the globe rapidly and begin to kill uh, really uh, hundreds of thousands in the span of several months. One of the big challenges globally is obesity and the risk of cardio diabetes or cardio diabetic uh, factors. And, and the greatest rise in uh, diabetes and obesity is occurring in low and middle income countries. There's a projection that there'll be 630 million diabetics in the world by 2045. Referring back to the last couple of slides, although I've talked about low and middle income countries, uh, we need to appreciate that we have the equivalent, equivalent of low and middle income countries in our own backyards here in the United States and in Atlanta. This is a paper published by 
colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the status of cardiovascular health across America, a behavioral risk factor and surveillance survey data of over 350,000 Americans. This is looking at the AHA's Simple 7, uh, Life Simple 7, and only 3% of American adults have ideal cardiovascular health. About 10% of American adults have poor cardiovascular health, and there are disparities by age, gender, education, and ethnicity. I served on the writing committee of our 2018 uh, blood cholesterol guidelines, and, and these guidelines are 121 pages. If you've not had a chance to read all 121 pages, go to the ACC guideline hub, looking at guidelines made simple. But we, we really uh, published uh, these guidelines, uh, taking a hard look at where we are today and, and, and thinking about uh, evidence-based recommendations for cholesterol management. 54 recommendations were class one or 2A, and we were the first guidelines to publish value-based recommendations, which will be in guidelines moving forward. Well, although today we have uh, many additional tools to lower cholesterol, such as PCSK9 inhibitors, this paper from Tom Maddox published in 2014, almost 2 million patients cared for by a cardiologist in the United States through the ACC Pinnacle Registry. Uh, looking at the blue bars here, this is for the four statin benefit groups, ASCVD, diabetes, LDL greater than 190, and a 10-year ASCVD risk greater than 7.5%. And 30 to 35% of these patients in cardiology practices in the United States are not even receiving statins. I like to use this quote from uh, Everett Koop, a former Surgeon General, uh, saying that drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. Two of the areas that cardiologists fare worst in are screening for diabetes and referral to cardiac rehabilitation. This is also from the Pinnacle uh, ACC Registry. For several years in a row, I had given presentations at the ACC summit meeting, and the summit meeting is a meeting focused on the economics of cardiology and card the practice of cardiology, and I call this the pyramid of cardiovascular economics. And you can see on this pyramid, at the bottom of the pyramid is cardiovascular prevention. Economically today, kind of the gum at the bottom of your shoe. Uh, at the very top of this pyramid are, are surgical procedures, ICDs. PCIs, TAVRs, and in a perverse way, our hospital administrators get excited when we're doing more surgeries and ICDs and revascularization procedures and TAVRs. Well, now that we're in the post-COVID world and we'll have an acceleration of change in healthcare, think to yourself that this pyramid is going to turn, and this pyramid may turn very rapidly in the post-COVID world, and someday when this pyramid is standing on its head, we will all think very di differently in terms of cardiovascular economics. So now moving on to the future, the post-COVID future of cardiovascular prevention, which, it, which truly represents unprecedented times. When we think about the future of cardiovascular prevention, there will be a need for a greater focus on comprehensive risk reduction and new care models. And the future of cardiovascular medicine will be and will have to be a greater focus on cardiovascular health and prevention. Uh, this is a paper we published a number of years ago in Jack, And this is uh, the, the central illustration that depicts the health disease continuum. All the way to the right, you see a box that is red representing late disease. And as, as cardiologists, we frequently are encountering disease at a late stage and trying to do the best we can uh, to improve lives uh, and, and hopefully improve the longevity of the patients we care for. But it's important that we, we really think all the way at the left of this figure, uh, really better understanding what it means to be healthy versus diseased and focusing our efforts on health promotion and disease prevention. We published this paper as a companion to the 2018 Cholesterol Guidelines Use of Risk Assessment Tools to Guide Decision-Making in Primary Prevention. Now, when we think of populations, we do a population risk assessment uh, in the general population, but we overestimate risk in those of high socioeconomic status. And, 
and patients who have access to care and who are engaged. And we underestimate risk in those with chronic inflammatory diseases, low SES, and, and many others. Donald Lloyd-Jones at the last ACC coined this uh, acronym CPR as how we should think about refining risk estimates. Uh, C, calculate, P, personalize, and R is reclassify. And so we really want to focus on CPR uh, for our patients so we don't have to do CPR on our patients. Uh, as part of our last 2018 cholesterol guidelines, uh, we, um, we published what are called risk-enhancing factors as part of the clinician-patient risk discussion, early uh, family history of heart disease, uh, metabolic syndrome present now in a third of Americans, CKD, chronic inflammatory conditions, history of pregnancy-related conditions uh, that increase risk, uh, not only around the time of pregnancy, but, but really uh, in young adulthood, high rate, race ethnicities, such as being South Asian, and then we, we also uh, looked at various lipid biomarkers. This doesn't mean you need to measure these in all of your patients, but if there's an elevated CRP, LP delay, I know Gina Lundberg spoke about this recently for Grand Rounds, APOB or an abnormal ABI, uh, this, these are risk enhancing factors. Well, the future, the post COVID future, is that cardiologists are going to need to feel comfortable with biologic therapies. We now have monoclonal antibodies for uh, interleukin, uh, uh, interleukins. We have uh, chemokine receptor inhibitors. And, and right now in phase three clinical trial, uh, a large scale clinical trial is lipoprotein little a antisense therapy. Since 2015, we have had PCSK9 inhibitors. This cartoon depicts PCSK9 up at the very top. Uh, PCSK9 has a protease involved in the turnover of LDL receptors. And so when we inhibit uh, PCSK9, these receptors get to hang out longer, soaking up LDL cholesterol and can reduce LDL by 60%. The data we have now from randomized controlled clinical trials, such as Fourier and Odyssey outcomes, uh, tell us that in addition to statins, uh, we can uh, significantly lower cardiovascular risk. I mentioned that two of the areas that cardiologists uh, really do not excel in is screening for diabetes, uh, comprehensive care of the diabetics, and also in cardiac rehabilitation, rehabilitation referrals. Uh, the pyramid on this figure here from a paper we published in Jack a few years ago uh, looks at the pyramid of cardiovascular prevention. Uh, we are typically caring for patients as cardiologists at the tip of this pyramid secondary prevention, the cat's out of the bag. Uh, the circle or the wheel looks at the core components of cardiac rehab, a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach to cardiovascular risk reduction that is uh, physician supervised, typically nurse case managed. And, and right now, when we look at cardiac rehab, uh, this is also from the NCDR Pinnacle Registry. Um, in general, cardiac rehab referral rates are poor, uh, over a quarter of U.S. programs have less than 20% of their patients referred to cardiac rehab. It's a class one indication, a quality of care step that's often missed. And this has to do a lot with where we prioritize our resources. Going back to the pyramid of cardiovascular economics, there are clearly systems-based solutions. Cardiac rehab reduces uh, total mortality and cardiovascular mortality. In a dose-dependent fashion, it reduces uh, hospitalization and improves symptoms. Uh, and the future of this will be home-based models, E and M health, and hybrid models. In this paper we published a few years ago, uh, what we will do in the future is risk stratify patients. And really, the majority of patients who are low to intermediate risk can be uh, cared for by home-based uh, or hybrid-based programs, and, and there will still be a new need for center-based programs for those at the very highest risk. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the majority of cardiac rehab programs around the country are completely closed right now. And so think about these high-risk individuals with cardiac conditions, serious cardiac conditions that are putting them at higher risk, not only for COVID-related uh, disease, but the fact that they're out of touch with care 
uh, right now, there are gaps in care, is, is also another wave of what we're going to see with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as uh, those presenting to hospitals with heart attacks and strokes have dropped significantly. Uh, so uh, we know there are many people out there still having events and quite sick that are not seeking health care because of fear. So the future of cardiac rehab will have to be patient-centered, delivered through easily accessible care models that emphasize value in healthcare outcomes and cost effectiveness. The post-COVID future is going to be an acceleration of new care models. We've already seen this with our, our leap into telehealth and telemedicine. It will likely be a decreased use of ineffective and low, val uh, low value care. Uh, it will accelerate the volume to value transformation and, and a rapid movement to further uh, integrate healthcare and consolidate healthcare. When we look at uh, some of the, the challenges we have with prevention, as clinicians, one of the biggest challenges is called therapeutic inertia. This paper we published about six months ago in Jack uh, tells us that, that there are solutions for therapeutic inertia. And, and really the greatest solutions are at the systems level. Uh, we really need to focus more on population approaches and, and really, we should be uh, very aware that right now in the COVID pandemic, the only patients that we're aware of in terms of our, our clinical uh, view are those that are seeking our advice through our portal that we're seeing through telemedicine clinics. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a real population approach to our care and we could invest our efforts right now in those who are the very highest risk patients we care for being proactive and preemptive in contacting them. This is a paper we published in Jack now five years ago, looking at challenges to utilization and adherence of guideline recommended therapies. Uh, and these challenges are at the level of clinicians, our patients, but still the biggest win is at the health system factor, the solutions here having to do with improving that clinical inertia, uh, population approaches to care, uh, and using our technology to, to improve our approaches to care as, opposing to as opposed to hindering us. Our cholesterol guidelines were the first to publish two uh, guidelines related to, uh, to quality and value and three guidelines related to implementation. Uh, and right now we, we really need to realize that guidelines th themselves are not sufficient. It's the implementation of evidence and guidelines that will lead us to better care, improving adherence, identifying those who are not receiving guideline-directed medical therapy, and really guiding us in our clinician-patient risk discussion and shared decision-making. Uh, central to the cholesterol guidelines <clears throat> is the clinician-patient risk discussion. So in all of our patients in primary prevention, we should be calculating a 10-year ACC AHA risk estimate talking to our patients about their risk, uh, further and fine tuning the risk, as I mentioned, talking about the benefits of therapies, the risk and side effects of therapies, and then embarking upon a journey of shared decision making. The Berry 2D trial uh, was a trial that we were a site for at Emory. Uh, 2,300 diabetics with obstructive coronary disease randomized to revascularization at the discretion of their clinicians, either PCI or surgery, further revascularize, re, re, excuse me, further uh, randomized to insulin providing versus insulin sensitizing regimen. The primary outcome was mortality. And after five years, no difference in mortality. Uh, we looked at seven different simple risk factor measures uh, that we all know and measure uh, frequently, including smoking, lipid measures, uh, blood pressure, and A1C. And really uh, publishing this paper in Jack, the, the greatest predictor of our patients with diabetes and obstructive coronary disease is comprehensive risk reduction. Uh, in this figure here, the risk of death and risk of a composite of death, MI stroke, is related to the number of risk factors at goal and the number of risk factors that are optimal. The ischemia trial just published within the past month or so in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, Leslie Shaw, one of our former faculty members at Emory, was one of the PIs for ischemia, uh, the largest study of its kind, building upon courage, very 2D, and ischemia is, is a more modern look at uh, patients with 
moderate to severe ischemia greater than 10% uh, through measures uh, of echo or nuclear. Uh, CTA was done on the front end, and so patients with left main disease were excluded. But a co conservative strategy here uh, was equivalent to an invasive strategy. So optimal medical therapy versus OMT plus an invasive strategy appeared to be fairly equivalent in this population. I've worked significantly in the space of the intersection between diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Our 2018 ACC expert consensus decision pathway uh, points out that we have novel therapies today for risk reduction in the diabetics with ASCVD. The figure here uh, at the bottom um, in the, the red boxes uh, points out that the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists are not now drugs we should think of as A1C or glucose-lowering medications, but these are medications to reduce cardiovascular risk. Uh, in the next several months, we'll be publishing our 2020 expert consensus decision pathway in uh, focusing on this same arena. We do need to focus more on implementation of precision public health. Uh, we debate a lot about the future, whether it will be precision medicine or population health. Uh, Adam Mitchell uh, in Grand Rounds two weeks ago talked about the polygenic risk score, looking at over 6 million SNPs. Uh, and here we can find a population uh, that is at as high of a risk as those with FH, representing a tenfold greater um, portion of the population. This was a paper published a few weeks ago in JAMA, and it raised the question going back to the, the social determinants of health, whether we should have a polysocial risk score. Really what determines our health is, is not health care, uh, but it is the social determinants of health, and these social factors are complex and interrelated uh, and may help us better target healthcare interventions programs and resources. We should be thinking on the level of our individual patients, but also on the level of population health. Uh, this bell curve distribution of BMI uh, is just one example of how if we nudge the health of the population a little bit to the left, we will significantly improve uh, the health of our population. This is the health disease, uh, healthy impact pyramid, uh, published by Tom Frieden now 10 years ago. On the left is how we think about populations, on the right is individuals, and we need to think about uh, very differently about how we approach population health, our physical food and social environment, and those social determinants of health versus the clinical in interventions at the top uh, that we tend to focus on predominantly when we care for individuals. We, we definitely need comprehensive and complementary prevention programs, which focus on where we live, work, learn, and play. We will always need traditional healthcare, although traditional healthcare will look very differently. Uh, but as we've seen in this pandemic, uh, we need public health and global health the influence of industry and workplace, our communities, environmental engineering, uh, and, and government uh, involvement as well. I know you're familiar with the term precision medicine, which is providing the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, uh, but a term coined by Muin Curry at the CDC is precision public health. This is providing the right intervention to the right population at the right time. Well, a post-COVID future will certainly need to focus more on cross-sector training, partnerships, registries, and global collaboration. Uh, at Emory, we started one of the first preventive cardiology fellowship trainings in training programs in the country. Thanks to the CATS Foundation, uh, we've been at this uh, really training preventive cardiology fellows now for two decades. Uh, but a funded training program that is looked at as a model uh, for the past decade or more. Uh, we absolutely will need more individuals who are preventive cardiologists, uh, but the future will be a need for cardiovascular prevention specialists uh, to serve our greater communities, cardiometabolic and diabetes care specialists, and population-focused public health-oriented cardiovascular prevention specialists. Now, six years ago, uh, we hosted uh, 
uh, the first cardiometabolic think tank in the US with 22 organizations, and published the Cardiometabolic Health Alliance, working towards a new care model for the metabolic syndrome. Uh, once you start paying attention to your patients, especially as cardiologists, about one third to 40 to 50% of the patients we care for have the metabolic syndrome. This is really the most common reason we're seeing that early heart disease uh, blossoming in our country. It's the obesity epidemic leading to cardiometabolic risk. In this figure, we looked at the absolute risk for end organ damage uh, in cardiometabolic risk and the stages of the evolution of metabolic syndrome. Stage A at risk, and this risk can be related to genetic risk, but also social risk. At stage B, you're developing the metabolic syndrome, but do not have it yet by definition. Stage C, you have it by definition, but without end organ damage. And stage D, you have the various manifestations of metabolic uh, syndrome, including cardiovascular diseases, CKD, sleep apnea, uh, fatty liver. And, and we will need to tie together our community care to our health care to our public health. This paper we published in Jack now uh, in the past year uh, tells us that as cardiovascular specialists, we need to be attuned to the intersection between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and the heart. Patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, their greatest risk is cardiovascular diseases until they get to cirrhosis. And so as we detect those with fatty liver, this should be a signal uh, that these patients are at increased risk for early cardiovascular diseases. Emory has been a site for the National uh, FH Registry since its inception. Uh, Gina Lumberg is now our PI, uh, and FH affects greater than one in 250 individuals in the U.S. So we definitely need more to focus on registries, the ACC's uh, NCDR Diabetes Collaborative Registry uh, is the first registry to look at the spectrum of cardiometabolic and diabetes care across primary and specialty care. We have over 4 million individuals now in this registry eight metrics, not just looking at the heart, uh, looking at uh, nephropathy, uh, diet, physical activity, eye exam, and foot exam. On a global level, we published the roadmap for cardiovascular disease prevention for individuals living with diabetes, emphasizing the importance of implementation science and integrated approach to those living with diabetes, but also connecting the dots between healthcare systems and public health and public, public policy. Well, Pooja, in my introduction, uh, mentioned that as of October of 2019, uh, I have had the honor to serve as the executive director of the US Million Hearts Initiative. Uh, the Million Hearts Initiative was started in 2012, specifically as a partnership between the CDC and CMS. Uh, and the aim of the Million Hearts Initiative, now in its second phase, is preventing a million heart attacks strokes and cardiovascular events in the U.S. by keeping people healthy, optimizing care, and focusing on priority populations. You can see keeping people healthy is, is coming back to public health and public policy initiatives, optimizing care, which is what we should be doing, uh, absolutely from a health systems approach, and improving outcomes for priority populations, African Americans with hypertension, the young adults in our country who are suffering greater rates of cardiovascular diseases, those with established disease, those with mental health and substance use disorders. The CDC has designated the Million Hearts Initiative one of the six winnable battles. That's a, a public health priority where the CDC and its partners can make significant progress in a relatively short period of time. And you can see the six winnable battles outlined right here. And and right now, um, we are in the midst of, of a battle, and this battle is, is going to be a prolonged battle related to COVID-19. So what will be the post-COVID future, or what is the need for the post-COVID future in cardiovascular prevention? These are the three buckets of cardiovascular prevention. The green bucket on the left is, is where we play in, the space of traditional clinical prevention. The gray bucket on the right is, is the public health world. Uh, and the, the blue bucket in the middle is that intersection between clinical medicine, public health, 
it's the community. And we really want to fill up all of these buckets and have these buckets intersect. What I've learned about over the last uh, number of months as I've served the Million Hearts Initiative is, is there are success stories in the US, the Be There San Diego program, where they have reduced the risk of heart attacks in San Diego and now across the state of California, Nashville Health, the Kaiser California Hypertension Control Initiative, the South Carolina Collaborative, and the Minneapolis Focus on Comprehensive Cardiovascular Risk Factors. Well, getting back to our cardiology grand rounds, this past summer, Zlatko Frost, who is the director of the Ljubljana Heart Center in Slovenia, gave our grand rounds when he was visiting with us as a visiting professor at Emory. Slovenia is among one of the few countries in the world today where cardiovascular disease deaths are number two. Cancer has overtaken cardiovascular diseases. And, and if you look at uh, a Vox uh, publication earlier this month, Slovenia is one of the coronavirus success stories. A population of 2 million, Slovenia has had a nationwide cardiovascular prevention program in, in place for the past 20 years. Slovenia had an early lockdown related to COVID-19, quarantined individuals who were COVID positive and has had significant uh, government support. So I've taken you on a tour of the past, the present, and, and really what I wanna do is highlight the future, the future uh, of COVID, uh, the, the post-COVID world of cardiovascular prevention. I'm originally from New York. I'm gonna end with a yogiism. Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, but the future is here. Uh, we certainly need to focus more on new care models, opportunities for precision public health, cross-sector cross partnerships and collaborations. And I think this is what the Cardiovascular Prevention Center of the future will look like. Up on the board there is our population. Uh, we have our team focusing on the population. Those who are green, we're really happy with, but we really wanna focus on those in the red zone. Uh, and doing all we can to move them from the red zone to the yellow zone. And I hope in the Cardiovascular Prevention Center of the future uh, that these folks working at the center will be working at treadmill workstations uh, or pedal workstations, or at least not sitting uh, while they're at work. Thank you for allowing me to present the last grand rounds of this year. Um, and I was on a jog in our neighborhood uh, you can see the photo in the upper right uh, is, was in somebody's front yard thanking us here in Atlanta, uh, the CDC and Emory Healthcare for all that we do. And I want to thank uh, our colleagues here for all the, the great work they've done uh, on the front lines and the great work they've done as a health system, uh, trying to do all they can, uh, serving the community right now experiencing uh, the worst pandemic we have in over 100 years. Thank you very much. I'm glad to address questions or comments, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give this grand rounds. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of minutes here, um, two minutes uh, till 8.30. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I have a question. Are we allowed, how do we refer people right now to, for home cardiac rehab, and is it reimbursed? Yeah, so, so this is an important question, Pooja. So, so right now, there are a few programs around the country that have hybrid models in place or what we call home cardiac rehab. Um, the Mayo Clinic, um, there's a program at Henry Ford Medical Center. Uh, the challenges right now have to do with reimbursement. And, and really, um, as part of Million Hearts, we have the National Cardiac Rehab Collaborative with over 400 programs participating. Uh, what we're finding is that most cardiac rehab programs right now are, are really shut down. The programs are still reaching out to their patients, but there's absolutely no reimbursement. And so uh, looking back retrospectively, it would have helped a whole lot to have these hybrid models in place today. Uh, and we are working on a national level to accelerate these new care models. And, and I do think in the post-COVID world of cardiovascular prevention, we're going to see an acceleration of a lot of things in healthcare. Um, but this is one of the areas that I, I think you're gonna see developing very rapidly because we have the tools to deliver it today. Uh, we need validation and we need implementation. 
you covered it all. Well, I'm not sure that I covered it all, but, but, but I, I think we need to open our eyes that uh, right now we're taking it one day at a time, and, and that's really the right approach. That's what we should do and can do, although we need, we need definitive strategy. Uh, we need definitive strategy to address the COVID pandemic uh, from a healthcare standpoint and from a national standpoint. Uh, but as I hope I've uh, highlighted in my presentation today, uh, we need strategy for healthcare moving forward and, and healthcare as it relates to the greater, um, the greater buckets of cardiovascular prevention. Okay, great. With that, it's uh, past 8.30, so we'll close grand rounds. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Pooja. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.